the current discourse around artificial intelligence, including generative AI, something we will probably talk about, um, is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely full of panic, uh, which is uh, unnecessary. And perhaps it is a bit of a disservice because instead of focusing on things that are to be solved and, and some challenges ahead, we are just clearly falling into that Terminator narrative. This week, we are talking all things AI. I know it's the hot topic of the year. There's certainly a bit of an AI race when it comes to not just the technology of it, the innovation of it, but also a lot of talk about who's going to be regulating it and a bit of a race between the US, the EU, maybe even China. Uh, the interest in AI, as we know, has really exploded since ChatGPT was introduced back in November of 2022. We see that in Google search trends, everybody all of a sudden taking a huge interest in AI, but we're also getting a lot of messages of fear. Some of those messages are coming from the people that are actually leading the AI innovation, comparing the risk of human extinction caused by AI to societal scale risks like pandemics and nuclear war. The signatures on that statement include CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman. He's the one behind ChatGPT. The leaders of Google's DeepMind, Anthropic CEO Dario Amode, and many other leading experts. So our guest today is Alexandra Pregolinska. She said that I could use the American pronunciation of her name, uh, but her last name is actually pronounced. Pregolinska. Thank you, Alexandra. Alexandra is the Senior Research Associate at Harvard on AI Robots and the Future of Work. She has a PhD in Philosophy of Artificial Intelligence from the University of Warsaw. She's also the head of Human Machine Interaction Research Center at Kosminski University in Warsaw. She's also gonna tell us a little bit about her less conventional way of getting into AI from a professional level. So that's all part of the conversation. Let's get into it. Alexandra joining us now. Alexandra, it's so good to have you. You, I think, are just going to give us such a great perspective on the world of AI. Where are you joining us from today? I am joining you from Warsaw, Poland, um, so from quite far away. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'd love to get started with this conversation on how you got into AI in the first place. Tell me a little bit about your story. Oh, that's an interesting story because actually myself and everybody on my team, we came to AI from other fields. So we are sort of DIY AI people, you could say. I, um, I, I was studying, so I, I studied philosophy uh, and I just had one lecturer who was uh, actually from a polytechnical school, so from a technical university and gave us a lecture about artificial intelligence uh, from the philosophical perspective, you know, uh, how that's going to change humanity, challenge humanity, what are the questions that are interesting when you think about a future um, evolution of AI systems um, and our boundaries as humans. And I think that triggered me to actually focus on that a little bit more. Uh, then I did my PhD in philosophy, but it was already focused on the Turing test, which is very important in the context of bots and conversational uh, assistance. So it was mm. still kind of more theoretical, but I started programming at that time. And yeah, for the past 10 years or so, I've been just a practitioner of machine learning, data science, and artificial intelligence in general. And you said that that's a pretty typical path, that everybody's coming from different backgrounds and getting into AI? I, I think that that is still the case because you know, a couple of years ago, there was no way to actually formally study artificial intelligence. I, I guess you could um, study parts of AI, uh, for instance, if you took some classes, courses in computer science, but those programs in artificial intelligence that are specifically focused on AI are, are fairly new. So most of my friends and colleagues, my peers are, you know, have been studying uh, cognitive science, computer science, statistics, uh, also sociology, neuropsychology. So uh, I guess many people from many different disciplines now form um, the AI community. 
And I love the philosophy connection because philosophy is all about fundamental questions. And there are so many questions to be answered about how AI fits into all of our lives. What would you say are some of the emotions that we struggle with when we're reckoning with the AI development going on? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, I think the most prevalent emotion is probably fear. When you think about it, uh, the way the story of artificial intelligence is being told to us by um, pop culture, by uh, media, by uh, by also movies uh, that we like, like Mm -hmm. the Terminator. It is mostly really a story that is infused with with fear, with uh, a sense of threat, where artificial intelligence can reach a level where it figures out that it's also as smart as we are, or perhaps even smarter, and then becomes our enemy. And I think it's in many ways um, uh, a story about our history, how we've struggled and, um, you know, how there were so many conflicts and revolutions um, as we were moving forward as a civilization. And I do think that we kind of put many of these fears into AI because this is something we know. So this is definitely a very... I would say important a feeling or emotion that accompanies the development of artificial intelligence. But then also, I think on the other hand, we are absolutely intrigued, right? It's an intriguing field. Uh, we don't have any other technology that is so close to us that can also communicate with us, have a perception of reality, uh, see something, hear something, respond, uh, make inferences, you know, um, reason also. So I think in that way, we are challenged by it, but we're also very interested in, and intrigued by um, by it and how it's going to um, you know, evolve in the future is, is a very intriguing question here. Well, and I, I have an interesting question about that too, because you, you talk about the fear and the concerns about you know, Terminator and Skynet. Do you think us as a society, we do a disservice because every time something interesting in AI comes up, we immediately go to the bad rather than the possible good? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yes, I absolutely agree with that. So I'm, I'm definitely on the, I hope, rational side here. So very often uh, I would just say, hey, let's not panic. It's just a technology. Uh, AI is a statistical model. It's very good at what it does, and it can be very helpful to us. But nonetheless, it's just a tool. Um, but there are many other experts also, you know, people who are also prominent in the field who are uh, clearly afraid of this technology. Uh, maybe, um, you know, the sense of fear is, is sort of natural. Um, we've evolved uh, that way to be a bit scared of innovation and maybe it had some, you know, solid foundation. Maybe it made sense to be afraid of something new because it prevented something bad from happening. So mm-hmm. I think we've evolved with that attitude and that's why it's, it's, so, uh, it's so, well, often seen, I would say. But then again, um, it is true that uh, the current discourse around artificial intelligence, including generative AI, something we will probably talk about, mm-hmm. um, is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely full of panic, uh, which is uh, unnecessary. And perhaps it is a bit of a disservice because instead of focusing on things that are to be solved and, and some challenges ahead, we are just clearly falling into that Terminator narrative immediately, right? And that does not help us in, you know, kind of rational uh, thinking and kind of planning, strategizing uh, around this technology. So that I think is a problem. Yeah, I think everybody from my mom to OpenAI, Sam Altman, is warning about these existential threats that AI could bring to society. I was just talking to my mom about this last night and direct quote, she said that AI scares the shoot out of her. I'm not censoring (laughs) her. That's actually what she said. But I tried to dig a little deeper and say, you know, what is it specifically about AI that's scaring you so much? And she said that mostly what she's seeing are really negative examples out there about bad actors using AI. For example, you know, voice scamming and trying to get people out of money by pretending to say mimic someone like my voice and calling up a loved one and demanding money. Um, She said that the messaging out there felt really scary to her and she didn't know where the world was gonna go from there. And then, you know, that's someone who is in the baby boomer generation, really isn't going to um, interact too much with AI in her life. But then you take someone like Sam Altman, who's telling Congress 
kind of the same thing, that if this technology gets into the wrong hands, we do have reason to fear. And that's why people need to act on regulation. Mm. Well, Sam Altman is, is obviously telling the Congress that we should all be scared. But then again, he's incubating GPT-5 as we speak. So this is, you know, this is a, an interesting, I would say, collision, right? Of, right. Uh, of what, do you think is the, what do you think is the motivation there? Well, I think that there is a, a sense and uh, that is common. And this is something that I also uh, share, that this is a very powerful technology. This is a very disruptive technology. And it can be, like you said, misused. Um, voice cloning, deep fakes. Uh, I'm from Poland. Um, I remember the first part of the war in, in Ukraine. And, you know, I remember deep fakes of President Zelensky mm. um, spreading all over social media. And they were not so well done. So thankfully, we were, we were sort of able to recognize immediately that this is just a deep fake. But let's think about a scenario where they are done very well and they can really disrupt um, um, you know the, the the public sphere i would say so 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 there are uh, really i think reasons to be concerned and to be worried and it is um uh, rational to uh, voice them somehow to say that we have a problem here we have a couple of um probably we have a probability that this will be used in a way that we don't really like and i'm okay with that and i think regulation is, is really something that is uh, necessary we will also have a regulation in Europe. Uh, it's right. called the AI Act, right? It's been drafted for the past two years and sort of chat GPT happened in the meantime. So now they have to redraft it a bit. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a regulation that uh, looks at AI from the perspective of risk mainly, right? Where it says, okay, most of the applications of artificial intelligence that we have seen so far, um, well, we could call them a minimal risk, but there are others that are high risk. And there is also a way of using artificial intelligence that we would rather ban, right? Like mm. social scoring, for instance, or, or surveillance systems of different kinds. So, so I, I do think that uh, a discussion is, is needed. But the, just, the, the, you know, the, there are many ways to lead this discussion, I think. And, and for me, the problem is that if you're spreading hysteria, really, and, and, mm -hmm. and fear, and if somebody talks about the percentage of chances uh, of AI kind of getting rid of humanity and says, oh, it's 17 percent, right, 17 percent, and I'm at the same time kind of creating this technology, then this to me seems really... Uh, a bit strange, right? Either you say, okay, there is a chance that this technology will be misused and this is the way I would like to address these concerns. Or you're saying, well, it's ultimately the worst thing that can happen to humanity and I just simply stop building it at all. And uh, and to me, just when I hear, um, you know, the latter being said from people who are actually most prominent players in the field of generative AI, mm -hmm. I, I just I just feel that I don't I don't really understand where that is going. Yeah, and we've heard some of those uh, lead players talking about several month pause and any kind of development. But I yeah, tend to agree Elon with Musk. right. <laughs> it was, yeah, but he's a, he's kind of he has a bit of a problem because uh, Elon Musk is is clearly you know involved in in, in building artificial intelligence. He's been involved uh, and he's been one of the first investors in um, OpenAI's ChatGPT. Um, but now he's no longer, you know, a, a part of, 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 of that group. So I think maybe he has some regrets mm. uh, being left with Twitter instead of surfing this big AI wave. So that might be also, you know, a reason why he wanted to ban it or at least stop it for some time so that maybe he could uh, try to build something on his own. I think he mentioned something called uh, Truth GPT as an alternative to Chad GPT recently. I wonder if that's a merger with a... Trump's truth social. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not uh, spreading any rumors here. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because you have been in AI for about a decade. So you have this perspective to see that when I looked at Google Trends and when people really started ramping up interest in AI, it really did come right when chat GPT was released, even though people like you have been working in AI for a very long time. Um, is that what you saw, just this insane interest kind of come up overnight? Yes, I, I think this is the most surprising thing because, well, um, um, I think artificial intelligence has been trending for the past 10 years or so. I, I've seen interest, right? Business, mm -hmm. 
clearly got interested in it. And, uh, you know, around 2010, we had that interesting collision of three factors. So we've had big data, new types of algorithms inspired by the human brain. So deep learning, neural networks, and then computational power, computational capacity. And that sort of built these three pillars have, have built artificial intelligence as we know it today. So I've been seeing, you know, uh, over the course of those past 10 years, a lot of interest. Uh, mm, social media is a great example here. Obviously, various recommendation systems, your news feed, that is all built based on AI, weather forecasting, uh, mm, you know, different types of applications of AI in the banking sector, in the health sector. We've seen that, but it is true that uh, since November uh, last year, everything has changed. And I think the reason for that is that ChatGPT being, I think, in many ways, uh, sort of a, an emblem of this new paradigm in, in artificial intelligence is just so accessible, right? So everybody can use it. Many of us use it for free. And also, instead of coding it, you just talk to it. And I think mm -hmm. that is the main difference, the difference of the interface that is so accessible and uh, so relatable in many ways. Everybody uh, can use it in a very intuitive way. And I think this is the part of the revolution, this low code or no code approach to artificial intelligence where you are actually interacting with a very complex system while at the same time, this interaction seems like, uh, you know, it's like, it's like talking to a friend. And you mentioned the fact that AI has been out there in algorithms and, and everything for, for quite some time. But I, I guess yeah. the question is, is generative AI really a game changer or is it because of the accessibility that you mentioned i mean it's obviously very mm -hmm. interesting it's obviously very powerful but the reality is is it what's going to move ai forward or is it just getting a lot of money because it's interesting and people understand a little bit more mm. well i i think um uh, i would agree with that because well we've had systems like chat gpt uh, we've seen similar architectures since 2017. And funnily enough, Google was the first company to introduce such algorithms. At that time, it was not BARD, but it was mm -hmm. BERT, uh, <laughs> a tribute to BERT from the Sesame Street. This is a real story. And uh, th that architecture already was kind of interesting, right? So we knew of it and we knew that it is very good at uh, statistically sort of figuring out how a sentence should end a sentence that was started by humans. So just this completion, right? So the next word after this word should be this one. And th mm. that fits the whole sentence and the context. So um, that has been done. And many people, I think many of us did not even notice that in Gmail, you had that function that a system would kind of give you small predictions of, you know, how to finish that sentence or your whole email, or perhaps, you know, um, what would be a good uh, topic or subject of your email, taking into account what you've written. All of that was already based on transformers, so systems similar to ChatGPT. That's how we call them technically, transformers. And um, ever since 2017, we've seen them evolving, right? And uh, OpenAI joined that race at some point and then uh, merged um, uh, with Microsoft and obviously used that big infrastructure of Microsoft to build something bigger, something that was really well fed with data, I mean, obviously the GPT engine and also add many more parameters to this model so that it could actually figure out what you mean when you say something to it, what you mean when you, when you give it a task, right? And it's very good at intent detection. So figuring out what your motivation is when you want something from it and then it can give you an adequate response. And I do think that, you know, technologically, this is not a major breakthrough, but in terms of accessibility, it is. And that's why I think we just, uh, um, we, we think of it as a revolution. And you talked about this overnight interest since ChatGPT in November, and how there's been this legislation that's sitting around for years over in Europe, it seems like right now, all of this conversation has really been sparked over who's going to regulate AI and this urgency behind that effort to regulate AI. Who do you think should be regulating something like this, though? I mean, you have to admit that politicians aren't really the most well-versed in the most groundbreaking technology. That is correct. And we've seen that uh, with, you know, the social media 
and the hearings of Mark Zuckerberg um, in the Senate, right? That there was a, a, right. a bit of a mismatch in terms of digital co competences. I don't know how, how to call it, you know, between the, the tech people and, and, and obviously, you know, the, the politicians. Um, mm -hmm. but, but ultimately, I think it has to be um, a collective effort, right, of many different stakeholders, because uh, this technology is not only about uh, technology, it's not about IT people and how they're going to use it, but it's a technology that is very, very broad. It's a general purpose technology, you could even mm -hmm. say, right? So it's the type of technology that will penetrate so many different professions, tasks, you know, uh, accountants, uh, healthcare professionals, uh, different people who are working in various organizations, business, uh, consultancy, uh, wherever you really look, you will see AI, right? So in that way, I think it has to be a collective effort. Uh, I do regret a bit that this regulation happens uh, this late because actually, you know, many people from the AI field have been calling for a regulation before chat gpt and way before chat gpt and we knew already that there will be some problems because some of these systems are just not explainable they're like black boxes they are very difficult mm. to understand and yet we use them we want them to make decisions about important things like giving someone a loan right in a bank or not or declining um so we really need to understand what these systems are um, just doing. And, and that has been a problem way before chat GPT. Uh, but now I am sort of glad that this, there's at least a debate. Uh, and I do hope that this time around the politicians will, uh, will come prepared and that they will be better prepared for these types of discussions. They do have experts. They can talk to many people. Mm. I have to say that I've observed, you know, uh, what's been going on at the White House. There was a meeting, obviously, between uh, Kamala Harris, I believe, and then many representatives of those companies that are building generative tools, generative AI. Uh, there has been a hearing at the Senate um, where one of the senators said that some Altman should tell everyone how to regulate AI. And I don't think it's necessarily the best way to go. I, th I think it has to be, um, well, we need at least a couple of rounds of different, um, different consultations. Uh, many companies have to be involved, but also NGOs, you know, uh, civil society, um, researchers who are not working perhaps in, in private companies, but also at universities. There are many people with good ideas, so it has to be a dialogue. And uh, I, I just hope that this time around, uh, we will do a better job than we did with the social media. What would be your goal with regulation? What's the, the end game to prevent bad actors? What, what is the goal here? Mm -hmm. Well, ultimately, I do think that we have many different challenges and some of them are more urgent than others so for instance what you mentioned uh, actually both of you uh, deep fakes manipulation um cloning um you know voice cloning i have an avatar i have my own deep fake and it's so good that for mm. me it's even sometimes hard to figure out whether it's her speaking or, or myself really that's so uncanny so um, but i obviously use it in a very transparent way uh, others may not want to, right, if they have other intentions. So uh, I, I think that this is the main challenge, transparency. I have to know that I'm dealing with AI um, when I see something on, on social media, uh, when something is being sent to me, I would need more transparency here. And I would need perhaps a way to detect that uh, effectively, because the current detectors of content generated, for instance, with ChatGPT do not reach even a, a level of 30% of accuracy, which is very, right. very low. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's a very confusing moment. I represent the academia. I see how other lecturers, teachers, you know, professors are struggling with that, that they cannot actually detect whether something has been produced with ChatGPT or not. Uh, ultimately, it's not about banning. It's not about punishing. It's just about transparency and figuring out how to use these tools in a, tr a trustworthy way. And also to prevent those bad actors from entering the scene with their you know, flood of deepfakes. Uh, so I think that is that is very, very important. And that's a challenge number one. Then challenge number two is obviously everything that has to do with jobs and, and the future of, of, of jobs, taking into account the automation that we are seeing. And I think this is more of a challenge than a threat 
but our our jobs will change and, and some jobs will probably disappear because of artificial intelligence. And I do think that politicians have to look at that as well. And then there are those, you know, futuristic um, stories, speculations about AI reaching some level of consciousness, becoming, you know, uh, uh, our enemy or just the sentient being that um, makes decisions on its own and uh, has some will to do things or not to do them. And, and that, to me, is not something that we should be talking about right now. I wanted to talk about a word that you use to describe your avatar, which was uncanny. I picked up on yeah. that and I was hoping that you could explain for me this concept of the uncanny valley. I've heard you talk on it before. Um, and I just thought it was a really fascinating look at where people should be designing AI versus where they should be steering away from. Can you talk to me about that? Yes, sure. Um, this is uh, a concept that uh, my team and I have been researching for the past couple of years. And uh, it was mainly focused on building robots and, and how not to build them, really. So the Uncanny Valley is this, is this concept that tells us that if something resembles a human being, but not fully, then we are scared of it, right? So mm -hmm. our probably uh, very deeply and rooted biological response to something that looks like a human and is not a human, and we know that, is mm -hmm. to just have this eerie sensation that this is not something we should be interacting with. So um, this is, uh, you know, something that we've known. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, a robot called Sophia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, very, very popular on, on social media, and it gives you that sensation or effect of the uncanny valley that is just sort of very confusing to figure out whether you're really talking to something that is alive or not, or, and is it healthy or is it sick? What's going on with it? Why is the mimic so weird, right? So why are the eyes rolling so slowly? So it does resemble a human, but then again, it's not a human. So... um and that is interesting because now in the era of, of deep fakes uh, and also in the context of, you know, the fact that we are mostly interacting with the digital world, not necessarily with physical robots, uh, this uncanny valley um, idea is, is very, very, I would say, problematic. And uh, we do see avatars that look almost exactly like humans where that immediate response of your body is just like acceptance, right? You're seeing something that looks like a human and, and it talks and it's all good, but then there's suddenly a glitch. And mm. that glitch is that moment when you realize that this may not be a human. Then who knows, maybe also in the future where there will be more of such deep fakes, we will become very cautious, right? And afraid of interactions with others because it will be very hard to classify who is it that we're dealing with. Yeah, that seems scary to me to think that you're talking to a real person or seeing something from a real person. And then there is that little hint that it's not real and you're second guessing what you can trust. And as you said, some of these um, faked generative images that are coming out now that are meant to manipulate markets, that are meant to manipulate elections, it, some of them are sloppy and you know, yeah. take a couple seconds and you can see like the instance of the Pentagon explosion, uh, which was faked, where you could look at the the fence and see the inconsistencies in the image. Yeah. But people will get better at that. Probably. Now they already know how to remove seven, eight or nine fingers, right? Because that's something that AI is quite often producing when you have an AI generated image. Quite often, when you look at carefully at the hand, there are more fingers than we usually have, like not five, but like more. So that <laughs> is a clear indicator that the, that this may be a deep fake. There are some professional tools to detect, detect deep fakes. And what is funny is that they're also uh, done using AI. So it's Mm -hmm. AI versus AI. Um, I believe there is a tool called Detect Fakes by MIT. It's like open source and, and fully open and, and free mm -hmm. to use. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think that any of us um, a couple of years ago that, you know, that we were thinking that maybe this will become a necessity to use tools like, like this one. But we are reaching a point where I think maybe we should start a conversation also with the social media platforms about fact checking once again and giving us more tools that would empower us to uh, get more transparency, right? And understand whether we are dealing with a, with a fake, deep fake video or with someone who actually 
recorded it. And I think this is a necessity right now. And that's why for me, this regulation is very important in that particular aspect, because I think there are many players involved here, particularly the platforms that are spreading content, sharing content. And I think over there, we should have some some tools that make it possible for us to to just figure out who is it that we're dealing with. If you don't mind me make playing devil's advocate on that last point about, you know, social media, because mm -hmm. I thought the same thing as you started to discuss this is like, why don't they have an AI algorithm, basically? So when you post something, you know, I know right now you said it's only about 30 percent accurate of telling whether something is generative or not. But, you know, doesn't that open the whole can of worms where if it accidentally flags something that's real as deep faked, then we're in the same issue that we're already in with social media. Now, again, I'm really playing devil's advocate to your point, but I know these will be the discussions mm. that come up. No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, this goes goes kind of both ways. So we can say, all right, uh, uh, let's imagine a politician that says, well, I have not done that. Uh, I, it's just a deep fake of me doing it. I have never done that. I don't know this person. Right. So on one hand, uh, there we can imagine a scenario where there are many uh, videos created and posted of, of, of something being done by someone who has never done it. But then on the other hand, if somebody has those bad intentions, they can clearly say, oh, this is not me. This is just deep fake. Right. I did not participate in that thing. I've never done it. And that creates also a lot of confusion. So so it is a problem. But but then again, you know, uh, if somebody can create a very powerful generative tool that can write a poem or a very good uh, code, you know, or can write an essay or a SWOT analysis or whatever you want, like ChatGPT does, then maybe that same company can build a detector. Yeah, uh, I think that if one is possible, the other one has to be too. Yeah, and I think that that's a tool that even, you know, elementary school, middle school teachers are going to need as they try to I determine, so. uh, did these kids write this themselves or did they input it and have ChatGPT or some other type of AI chatbot spit it out for them? Um, I know that we have covered a lot, but I really want to get into AI's impact on the workforce. There mm -hmm. is such division over this right now. Um, is AI going to be replacing jobs? Is AI going to be enhancing jobs? Are, you know, everyday Americans, Europeans, everyone around the world going to be out of work because they're being replaced by AI? How do we balance the obvious advances that AI can give in technology and in society with needing, you know, to allow humans to also play a role in this? Yes. Well, I, I think that a jobless future, um, you know, unless it's a, a, some sort of a luxury version of a utopia where we don't work or we choose to work whenever we feel like it and we rely on a very generous universal basic income. Well, that's probably not something that's going to happen. So we should push definitely for uh, a vision or, or scenario where humans are working and they are enhanced by artificial intelligence. So um, massive unemployment caused by AI is, I think, something that politicians should be thinking about and they should be very vocal about um, an, a, norm, a normative, I would say, approach to it, meaning, no, this is not what we want. Mm. Uh, we want people to work. And also, like, uh, there are many things that AI still cannot do. We tend to forget that these are just statistical tools that are very good at drafting things right now, but execution, operational uh, a part of, of, you know, doing business, working is, is, is very different from that. So I, I, so I think that we have to be realistic about it. And I do think that many jobs will be affected by AI, but probably um, in, a, in a positive way, at least when I think in that short term, mid term, uh, you know, perspective. Uh, what I think may happen is something that we are already seeing in the IT space. Uh, at the beginning, November, December uh, 2022, uh, code developers, IT people, IT specialists were very scared of uh, ChatGPT because it was so good at writing code, generating code just in, uh, you know, a couple of seconds. It could create something that would take you a whole day, for instance. Uh, and now what we're seeing is that they are saying, oh, it's a great tool that increases our productivity, mm -hmm. allows us to focus on what we do with our clients, 
instead of just pure code development, which has never never been the fun part anyway, all that much, <laughs> right? Um, and they still have to, you know, uh, merge that code together. They are still, you know, responsible for the whole architecture oversight strategy, and they just have to link many different pieces that ChatGPT generated for them. And I think for them, it's, it's a ma mainly a benefit. And in other professions, we might see similar things. So in that way, I wouldn't be scared. But then obviously you touched upon a very important part of decision making that we have to find or strike a balance where we are still the main or key decision makers. And for instance, I am now involved in a project that we are doing at my university in, in Warsaw Kosminski University with, with Harvard University. Uh, and in that project, we are uh, looking at collaborative AI. So the type of artificial intelligence that is, that is designed for collaboration with humans. So it does not do the job instead of you, but instead works together with you. And that's a very different approach, I think, can be very useful in many different professions. We are now testing our tool um, that is also generative uh, on salespeople and marketers. We've seen an increase in productivity, but also an increase in job satisfaction. And this is something that we would like, right? Getting rid of some routines and really fee really focusing in our work on something that is interesting and, and fun for us. So I, I do hope that this is the uh, trajectory that we will choose. And mm -hmm. I would really look very carefully at, you know, the speed and pace of automation, finding the proper use cases for it. Not everything can be done by generative AI and also not everything should be done by generative AI. So I, I do think that we have a bit of a road mapping to do ahead of us. Yeah. Do you think there's a risk of someone taking the technology a little bit too far just because the technology can go there and then by then it's too late, the cat's out of the bag and mm -hmm. you can't really figure out why it's a better case to have humans in that role over AI? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do think that many things can go wrong if you decide to choose that pathway of full automation and that um, many things can go wrong because this is just a technology. It's not, uh, you know, it does not have any experiences, any internal states, no affections, no emotions. And it's just, you know, simply designed by humans and it's prompted by humans. Uh, so you have to know how to use it in order to use it well. If you just rely on it, um, usually the results are not sp so spectacular. So in that way, I would say that those who choose full automation will probably um, not be very happy with uh, with their choice. That brings up something and kind of to Simone's point. I mean, yes, you know, I think the collaborative environment is the beneficial way. It's the best way for this to work. But there are corporations who have to worry about their bottom line. And when they start seeing, oh, I can have, you know, a computer basically do this, you know, yes, there should be somebody there, but maybe there's one person there dealing with a sales force of 10 chat GPTs, for instance. That's just a made up number, obviously. I mean, does that become mm -hmm. problematic mm -hmm. when they're looking at the bottom line over kind of what should be right and ethical in that business? Mm. Well, there is ultimately always or almost always in every profession a question of responsibility that you take for your work. And I think somebody um, like, you know, in the medical field, you can have many doctors that will use artificial intelligence for, uh, um, you know, in order to diagnose their patients, for instance, in a quicker way, more effectively. But then again, they have to sign that document and they have to say, well, this is what I believe is, is, is going on. And this is uh, uh, what I see. Uh, and this is my responsibility. Now, uh, we don't have a legal framework that would allow for AI to take the responsibility. We don't even know what that would mean. So ultimately, I think there is a, there is that question of responsibility and who did the job and who takes responsibility for the job. I think this is a, a big necessity in our world, which is a human world at the end of the day, where we use different types of tools. So uh, I, I think uh, you can see also how maybe professionals, different workers will migrate to different tasks that 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 I can um, imagine absolutely as, as, as an option. But I do remember that there was a report by BCG quite recently that said that 
those companies that are pioneering at scaling artificial intelligence are not releasing their workers. Instead, they're reskilling them and they're just, you know, completely reinventing their own strategy and their own business model and what they do, how they kind of use the workforce. So I think that is a, an interesting insight. Alexandra, with the final few minutes that we have with you, I was hoping that you might be able to help us answer some of the most searched questions about AI that happen on Google. So what mm -hmm. everyday people are looking for, are you game? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's do it. The first question I'll bring up is one that a lot of people are searching on Google. Who should learn AI? Everybody. That's just a plain answer. Everybody. I think everybody and starting in the primary school or earlier. Yeah, it'd be great to see that advancement happening for our kids. Um, oh, it's happening next... anyway, I think. Yeah. You know, kids are learning uh, intuitively. Um, mm. Maybe the school does not know about it and is not fully conscious or cannot, you know, um, somehow accommodate that. But nonetheless, the kids are, uh, they are digital natives. They are learning anyway. <laughs> That's good to hear. Is Alexa considered AI? Yes, well, it does have text to speech algorithms in it, so it can detect what you've said and analyze that. So it's definitely a machine learning based solution. So a set of algorithms that fits the AI umbrella. Okay. What is the most advanced AI? Oh, that's a hard question. Well, I'm inclined to say large language models like ChatGPT. But we should also look into companies like DeepMind that are building very powerful predictive uh, uh, tools uh, based on artificial intelligence that can play games like chess or Go. And that would be, I think, equally well developed. By the way, just to add into that, DeepMind's yeah. teaching it, the computer to play StarCraft and absolutely decimating professionals was unbelievable. That was one of the most fascinating yes, AI agreed. use cases. Because chess has a limited number of, of plays, but when you're playing on a big scale video game, it's it's much different. Sorry. Agreed, absolutely. <laughs> nope, that's why you're here, Brent, uh, to bring in the perspectives <laughs> that I cannot. <laughs> um, a couple of them are a little more existential. Can AI replace mm -hmm. human intelligence? Well, no, I think supplement it only. N not at its current form. If we go into, uh, I don't know, merging artificial intelligence with synthetic biology and creating artificial life, then who knows? But those algorithms that we are developing today, statistical algorithms, are complementing us, not replacing us, I think. And then this is another one that's most searched question. Can AI take over the world? <laughs> I think we've talked about it for the past 40 minutes or so. <laughs> well, no, I, 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 I don't think so. N not the AI that we know today. Uh, who knows, you know, what's going to happen in, uh, in 100 years from now. But those current models, um, they are very far away from any evolutionary processes that would allow them to build consciousness. And that's the first step to taking over the world. There are no other possibilities. And I think that that wraps us around full circle to where we came from at the beginning, which was the impact that perhaps movies are having in our perception of AI, which are predicting situations like that. But you're saying there's no reason to fear right now. Well, my favorite movie uh, where AI plays an important role is Interstellar. And I think mm -hmm. it's a great movie because it shows us um, a reality where we will have machines that will help us. And they don't have to be conscious. Uh, they don't have to be uh, s s that smart at all, but they're just helpful, right? And this is, I, I think, a, desire, a desired scenario forward. We'll leave it on that positive note there. Alexandra Pregolinska, thank you so much for your time thank today. You. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the invitation.